these are men with the future in their hands, or rather their heads. They are the young scientists in general, and the engineers in particular, on whom a whole society depends for its prosperity. They cost anything up to £16,000 a piece to educate. Custom built in Britain, and they're exported for free along the brain drain. These are the qualified men, of whom there is a desperate shortage, not just in Britain, but in the United States, where they're worth their weight in dollars. By 1967, they and their technologists were answering the ads in a big way, and leaving Britain at a rate that had risen to 6,000 men a year. Placing the brain drainers had become important international business. William A. Douglas has built an organization that has handled and sifted thousands of applicants for its clients. Britain's big problem is to recognize the brain drain as an opportunity, not a curse. To look forward, not back. This gives you a mandate to move in directions that your government has not moved yet. It gives them a reason for action. You are in international competition and you are losing to it because of pay structures, ways of handling people. Now is the time to get things straightened out. In North America in particular, the engineer can start higher up the ladder than he starts in Britain. He gets responsibility younger, he gets status, and he gets the cash. There's no reason why he shouldn't go off if he wants to, it's a free world. If he thinks he'll do better abroad, well, the fault's not his. Birmingham University is one of Britain's leading engineering faculties. They estimate that of every hundred students who graduate there, no fewer than 42 have eventually been going abroad. 42 lost. 24, some return from the brain drain, come in from overseas. The gap is critical. <laughs> some experts think the British system goes wrong way back at school. They say the boys lack true careers guidance. How many careers masters have really worked in industry? And how many rather look down on it? Youngsters get divided into streams at an early age, the art stream and the science stream. And this prevents many bright types from even considering engineering as a career. This is less true now than it was a few years ago. And with the introduction of new teaching techniques, many schools, like this one at Woodbury Down in North London, now give engineering its full place but perhaps they're still a minority. But the brain drain isn't just a one-way ticket to North America. There's a small brain drain in reverse from other countries. There always has been. Stephen Tobias, professor of mechanical engineering at Birmingham University, is an example. He came from Hungary. The problem of the brain drain will be solved because it must be solved. We can't go on losing these people at the present rate, and if we do, the consequences will be very serious. We shall not be able to keep our position in the export race. We shall not be able to innovate or to automate. And with this, our standard of living is going to fall. And we're going to keep them, not just by appealing to their patriotic feelings, but simply by paying them more. If necessary, a great deal more. The engineering faculty at Birmingham attracts students and research workers from every continent. Its equipment and facilities are as good or better than anything in America. One of its sections works on automated forges designed by the graduate engineers themselves. In this work, Birmingham is the most advanced of any research centre in the world. Meanwhile, Britain is trying hard to turn back the brain drain. Patrick Fryer is a director of a personnel consultant company. He travels regularly to America to help bring back the engineering talent. For government departments and industry now have specialists to represent them in North America, interviewing men of all grades who've gone out there and who may wish to return. 
James Gilchrist is an unusual example of the brain drain in reverse. He's an American, and he's come to Britain to take charge of research for a company that makes batteries. He believes that in this special field, there is more opportunity here than there is in the United States. So he spent his first few weeks in England house hunting and settling down in Stratford-on-Avon. But the brain drain isn't just sapping the nation's vitality in engineering and science. British doctors have been leaving the country at a net rate of at least 300 a year. Medical services keep going because half the junior doctors in hospitals come from abroad. Nowhere is the loss of engineers and technicians more serious than in the aircraft industry. Do some people say to the stop, go, stop policy that seems to have been adopted towards some projects. But the Concorde's different. It's one of Britain's most important probes into the future. And working on it are three men with a link in common. Alan Perry is a senior draftsman. So is Robert Lawry, both working in the Concorde design office. Derek Trotman is a group leader also working on the Concorde. All three of them joined the brain drain and went to the United States, where they worked in aircraft factories. All three of them are highly experienced technologists, typical of those who've been leaving the country in such alarming numbers. All three of them came back to work on the exciting Anglo-French project, which is Europe's most hopeful answer yet to the American domination of the air industry of the Western world. They came back for the same reason. They wanted their children to start their education in British schools, not American. They've come back to lower salaries, but to a life in which they feel more at home. Making a model plane is fun, but working on a real world beater is vastly more satisfying. And one of the things that has been tempting men like these abroad is the vast range of new projects that they can find on the other side of the Atlantic. The money is important, but it's only part of the story. Now, suddenly, the Americans are said to be closing their professional ranks and turning off the brain drain tap for three years. Experts like Professor Eric Laithwaite of Imperial College London, one of the world's greatest science foundations, believe that this could give the breathing space Britain needs, providing the time is used to bring the country up to date in its whole attitude to the trained engineer. A start needs to be made back at school by making everyone aware of the opportunities and excitements of engineering, right through from the classroom to the boardroom.